Uh, the arc length formula, which is on your formula sheet, is pretty straightforward I using it. There's just that wrinkle. It's not a big deal, but, well, it is a big deal if you forget about it. You have to be in radian mode in terms of your thinking. The number that goes into this formula for theta must be a value in radians and not degrees in order for the formula to work. So that being said, there were a couple of questions. I don't know if anybody has any questions, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask. Does anybody have anything you would like me to explain about this? Ian? 12B? B. D. Okay. So we have a radius of 6.25 inches, and the central angle is 282, and you're asked to determine the arc length. So theta equals A over R. I I'm a rearranging kind of guy. I would just rearrange this first and say A equals R theta. You could feel free to put in the value for theta and the value for R first and then cross multiply. The only thing is you need to take a little detour away from the problem and convert 282 degrees into radians because that's the number that needs to go in here. So you have a number of options available to you to do that. One is if this were a written response, and it could be part of a written response. This question on its own, everybody, is not a written response. But I'll show you examples later in the unit of a written response where part of the work would involve an arc length. Uh, you would need to show your work. And in that case, you could use a ratio since pi radians equals 180 degrees. We can write x radians over 282 degrees equals pi radians over 180. And I want to caution you here. If you have a written response question, it may be very obvious to you how to convert to degrees to radians, but you need to show that work. You need to write that down. That's what written response means. So we cross multiply that. If you read the question, it says we want answers in decimal form. So there's nothing, there's nothing to be gained by us finding an exact value here. We're going to crunch the numbers into a decimal anyway. So when I cross multiply, I'm going to take 282 multiplied by pi and then divide by 180. By the way, somebody a couple of years ago asked, does it matter what mode you're in when you're doing this? No. The mode only matters when you're using the sine key or the cosine key or the tangent key. We're not doing that here. So this number of radians is 4.92 radians. So we're going to then say A equals R, which was 6.25 inches times the angle in radians, which is 4.92. In other words, we just have to now multiply this in by 6.25, and we have our answer. Okay. Any other questions? Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? All right, we are going to move on. We are going to be looking today at something called the unit circle. So this is the next lesson in your unit handout. I think it's on page six. And um, you also have a sheet in front of you called building the unit circle. At the end of this lesson, you are going to have a, an enormous amount of information on this sheet called building the unit circle. And it's going to seem very daunting, is a good word. Very almost intimidating, all of the numbers and information that are on here. But if you can become very comfortable with what that picture is going to show you, you will be much better in this unit at trigonometry and in the next unit. Let me back up, though, and explain something to you. There are many things in this lesson that you need to know, period. But with that magnificent picture we're going to get of the unit circle on this sheet, it turns out that you can solve many problems by using this picture that we're going to create. 
But if you can't handle the picture we're going to create, there are other ways to weasel and maneuver your way towards the answer to those problems. So if you don't get the unit circle at the end of this unit, you can still survive in trigonometry. If you don't get it now, you want to work towards getting it day by day more and more because it will be more and more beneficial. Okay? It's, bottom line is if you can understand this thing we're going to create, it'll make your life a lot easier. Okay? It'll make problem solving easier. So, what are we doing today? We're going to derive and apply the equation of the unit circle. This is, without a doubt, something you need to know. This isn't something that if you don't know, you can solve problems in a different way. You need to know this. You need to be able to determine the equations of other circles whose centers are at the origin. You need to know that. This, find the coordinates of points on the unit circle for all of these different positions. This is the thing I'm talking about, that if you can't, you try your best and you still don't get it. And that's a rare student, by the way. But if you are that rare student, you can still do the math. So let's take a look at what the unit circle is. When you look at the phrase unit circle, the word unit in mathematics means one. Um, you, you don't often use the word unit to indicate the number one, but that's what unit means in mathematics. Uh, unless you're talking about what's the unit of area, right? The word unit can have different meanings, but by itself the word means one. So it's a circle of radius one unit, and it's centered at the origin. So there's a diagram in your note package showing the unit circle. I also am showing a rotation angle on there, theta. And the fact that theta ends in quadrant one is not important. Theta could end anywhere. Okay. And the question is, to begin with, oh, sorry, uh, one final thing. Uh, a point, we call it P, X, comma, Y. We can call it something else, and we will later. But it turns out that that point described by X and Y, those coordinate numbers, X and Y, are related to the trigonometric ratios of the angle. Okay? So if I say to you what is sine of theta, it has something to do with X and Y. If I say to you what is cosine of theta, it has something to do with X and Y. What is tangent of theta? Something to do with x and y. We will learn, I think tomorrow, that as well as sine of theta, cosine of theta, and tangent of theta, there's three other trigonometric ratios. Secant of theta, cosecant of theta, and cotangent of theta also are related to x and y. And what I'm telling you is on the unit circle, if you know x and y, you can figure out what the sine of theta is, what the cosine of theta is, what all of these ratios are equal to. So to begin with, what's the relationship between the x and y coordinates? We're not talking about trigonometry here. I'm just saying, if you knew x, how could you find y? And it's not a difficult task when you consider that we can create a right angle triangle this might be called the reference triangle because the right angle triangle contains the reference angle. In other words, when I create my triangle, I want to use the x-axis as one, as one of the sides. And if this radius is 1, then the hypotenuse of this triangle is 1. This is the x-coordinate, this is the y-coordinate. And it's a Pythagorean relationship. That's a Pythagorean triangle because it contains a right angle. So what is the relationship between x and y? Well, it's x squared plus y squared equals 1. If you know the x-coordinate and you square it, then you can take that away from 1 and take the square root to find the y-coordinate. We're going to do that in just a minute. But I want to give you an alternate example that I didn't put in your notes, and maybe I should have. Uh, I'm going to call this, um, well, I'll just put it down here and I'll just say example.
Is this point a point on the unit circle? Well, if it is, then x squared plus y squared has to equal 1. That's the equation of the circle. That, when I say that's the relationship between x and y, what that means is any x and y that make that true, that is going to form a point on the circle. So if I want to know if this is a point on the circle, I can check. I can take 1 half quantity squared plus 1 third quantity squared. This has to equal 1. And you know what? I'm going to back up for a second. I, I, I said something here that it's not wrong, but I need to clarify. The Pythagorean theorem says the hypotenuse squared equals the square of the other sides added together, right? This is what the Pythagorean theorem says, what I've just written. Why did I not put the squared on the 1 when I wrote my answer to question 1a? Why didn't I put the squared there, Jonathan? 1 squared is 1. And I'm sorry, I just did that in my head, and I, I thought, I, well, it's obvious to me. I shouldn't say it's obvious to everybody. It's not x squared plus y squared equals 1 because the hypotenuse or radius is 1. It's x squared plus y squared equals 1 because the hypotenuse or radius squared is 1. Do you get the subtle meaning of what I'm talking about here? You have to square the hypotenuse. So this is really our answer, but we probably wouldn't write 1 squared because 1 squared, as Jonathan said, is 1. So is this true? Is 1 half quantity squared plus 1 third quantity squared equal to 1? Find out. It's not, is it? I don't know what it is. Well, I mean, I can figure it out. It's equal to 0.83 repeating or something like that? No? 0.3613? Oh, right, I forgot to square, right. So it's no, nowhere close to 1, right? So the answer is no. In fact, I could amend what I've written here and just put not equal to 1, so the answer is no. What about... Zero point six comma zero point eight. It is. If you take point six and square it and add point eight and square it, by some miracle you get one, which you do. then yes, it is a point on the unit circle. And that would still be true, by the way, if it were 0.6 comma negative 0.8, because then we would have negative 0.8 quantity squared, and it would still become positive. So this will work with positive and negative numbers. All right, uh, B, a circle is centered at the origin, and it has a radius of 3. What would the equation of that circle be? Well. We don't necessarily have to draw this, but there's a circle, roughly. If this is the point x comma y, and this radius is 3, then the hypotenuse is 3, isn't it, when we create our right triangle? It doesn't matter what the other sides are other than the fact that they are x and y. So the equation of the circle in this case, would be x squared plus y squared equals 3 squared, which is x squared plus y squared is equal to 9. And once again, in this course, we want to go away from being concrete all the time and drawing things and looking at specifics and move into the abstract where we talk about generalities. What is the equation of any circle whose center is at the origin if the radius is r? Well, the radius would become the hypotenuse, so any equation 
of the form x squared plus y squared equals r squared would be the correct equation if the, if the circle is centered at the origin, where r is the radius. But again, everybody, I, I want to draw your attention to, for the most part, what this lesson is about is this circle. This is the unit circle. If the radius is 3, it's not a unit circle. All right, let's take a look at some examples based on that warm-up. The x-coordinate of a point on the unit circle is 3 quarters. What is the y-coordinate? And then we're asked to sketch it. So if I want to find the y-coordinate, then I'm going to use x squared plus y squared equals 1 because it's a point on the unit circle. And I'm going to pressure you to not use your calculator here. I know it's easy to do on the calculator, but we're going to graduate to a stage very quickly where that's going to be harmful, relying on it all the time. So what does it mean? It was 3 quarters, wasn't it? Okay. What does it mean when I square 3 quarters? It means that I square the numerator and I square the denominator. So now I have 9 16 plus y squared equals 1. I can subtract 9 16 from both sides. Well, 9 16 taken away from 1 is taking 9 16 away from 16 16. 1 is 16 16. So you have 16 16. You're subtracting 9 of them. You're left with 16 minus 9 is 7 16. And now I solve that little mini quadratic equation. And I write y equals the square root of 7 16 And I get the question wrong, right, because of what I've just written. What am I missing? Pardon? Plus or minus. Plus or minus. And then what we can do is go to a grade 9, 10 kind of thing where we say, well, that's plus or minus root 7 over root 16. Root 16 is 4. So the y coordinates are positive or negative root 7 quarters, root 7 over 4. And this makes total sense because if I go up here to my two diagrams and I've given them to you, and I locate an x coordinate of 3 quarters, 3 quarters is right here. There is a point where x is 3 quarters up here. That has an x coordinate of 3 quarters. There is also an x coordinate of 3 quarters down here. So there are two points on the circle where x equals 3 quarters. This one is at 3 quarters, comma, root 7 quarters. This one is at 3 quarters, comma, negative root 7, 3 quarters. <laughs> negative root 7, 3 quarters. Negative root 7 over 4. If you want to draw the terminal arm and show the rotation angle, this is the terminal arm. This is the terminal arm. Uh, it does have an arrow on the end of it. It goes on forever. This would be theta. And this would be theta. And we're done. Any questions with the first example? All right. Um, did we answer everything there? Determine the y-coordinates, sketch the rotation angles. Yeah, we did. Number two, the y-coordinate of a point on the unit circle is negative 1 over root 2, and the point is in quadrant 3. I want to just highlight something for you now. Let's get this out of the way. I would like you to calculate 1 over root 2. I know this says negative 1 over root 2, but I, I want to show you something else. On your calculator, I want you to get a decimal approximation 
of 1 over root 2. It's an irrational number, so when you get that number on your screen, that's not 1 over root 2. It's a decimal approximation because there's an infinite number of non-repeating decimals afterwards. And you should get, I believe, it's 0.707 something. Okay. What I would like you to do now is I would like you to calculate root 2 over 2. And you will notice you get the same number. So I'll explain why this is the case in a second, but from now on, it's like being bilingual. If you understand English and French, and you're thinking in English, and I walk in the room and I say, bonjour, you know I said hello, right? You understand they mean the same thing. Is that right? Bonjour is hello? Yeah. Okay. I just, because uh, I'm not bilingual, so. Um, these two are equal, so whether you say 1 over root 2 or root 2 over 2 is up to you. They are equal because you were taught in Math 20 that if you have something like 1 over root 2, you should rationalize the denominator by multiplying the top and the bottom of that expression by root 2. And when you multiply the top by root 2, you get this. And when you multiply the bottom by root 2, you get that. So just be aware that when you see root 2 over 2 on an exam, if you got 1 over root 2, it's the same thing. Okay. So getting back to this question now, uh, the y-coordinate is negative 1 over root 2. What is the x-coordinate? So we can write x squared plus y squared equals 1 because on the unit circle the radius is 1 and the radius squared is 1. So the y-coordinate is known. Negative 1 over root 2 equals 1. We have to square that, so my apologies. I need a squared on the negative 1 over root 2. Again, without the calculator, I can square the top of this fraction, negative 1 over root 2, and get positive 1. And when I square the bottom, I get 2. If I now subtract 1 half from 1, I'm left with this statement. But 1 minus a half is a half. So now I have to say x equals plus or minus the square root of a half, which means x equals plus or minus the square root of 1 over the square root of 2. And the square root of 1 is 1. So we get plus or minus, we get plus or minus 1 over root 2. And just like any other quadratic result where you have two answers, it means maybe they're both right, maybe only one is right, maybe neither of them are right. And in this particular question, only one of those is right because you were told it's in quadrant three. And in quadrant three, x is negative. So you don't need to write this, but if we say x equals one over root two, or negative 1 over root 2, we have to kick this one over the boards because it's not negative. And one of the things you notice here is that the ordered pair we get for x, we get negative 1 over root 2. For y, it's negative 1 over root 2. I don't know if this is obvious or not to all of you, but if the x and y coordinates are equal in quadrant 3, the point has to be halfway along that quadrant in terms of the arc on the unit circle. It has to be at 45 degrees. Because I'll exaggerate it, if this was where the point was, you can clearly see that the x and y coordinates have different numbers. The only way for them to balance out, I'm not going to get out the protractor, but 
does that look like about 45 degrees to you? Close enough. So this is the rotation angle, theta, and the point is negative 1 over root 2, comma, negative 1 over root 2, which is important for later when we build this unit circle. It's important for you to understand that any point that's at a 45 degree angle on the unit circle will have these numbers as coordinates. You know, they might be positive or negative, but they're going to be root 2 over 2s because root 2 over 2 is 1 over root 2. Any questions with number 2? Number 3, a circle has a radius of 5 units and is centered at the origin. It has an x-coordinate of 3.2. Since I haven't told you which quadrant it's in, there's going to be two points. If you look at the diagrams, did I give you the diagrams for this as well? Do they show a radius of 5? I want to make sure. Okay. So 3.2, I'm not going to get out a ruler and do this, but 3.2 would be about there, let's just say, R roughly. You know, you could get out a ruler and set up a ratio, but 3.2 is approximately there. And you see that there is a point above it that has an x-coordinate of 3.2. There is a point below it that has an x-coordinate of 3.2. So we are going to have two points here. In other words, when we get to the stage to solve for y and we go plus or minus, it's going to be two answers. Okay. Well, let's do that. We've got x squared, which is 3.2 squared plus y squared equals, it's not equal to 1, and it's not equal to 5. It's equal to 5 squared. Now, I'm going to do this originally, initially with you on the calculator, and then I will show you what we would have to do on paper. On the calculator, we would take 5 squared, which is 25, subtract 3.2 squared, which I don't know what 3.2 squared is, and, but I don't care what it is. I subtract it, I get 14.76, and then I take the square root, and I get this number, I try to convert it to a fraction, and I can't. So this is the pitfall, the downside of relying on your calculator. We want exact values. So if you wanted decimals, yes, you could say x equals plus or minus 3.8, or y equals plus or minus 3.84. But we can't do it that way. What we have to do is the following. We have to write 3.2 as a fraction to begin with. There's a lot of ways to do that. I suppose if you want to be lazy about it, you could just go 3.2, math, enter, enter. Um, I immediately see 3.2, and I think 32 over 10, and then I can reduce it down to 16 over 5. So this is 16 over 5 squared plus y squared equals 25. So y squared equals 25 minus 256 over 25. Now, let me back up. I concluded this statement or this calculation up here that you're looking at on my calculator where it ends at 3.84. I concluded my little mini lesson there by saying this is why you can't use your calculator. It's not a rational number. But you can use your calculator to figure out what this is. We don't have to do a common denominator of these on paper. We can figure out what 25 minus 25 minus 256 over 25 is. In fact, you could have entered 25 minus brackets 16 over 5 squared. I just know that 16 squared is 256. Geez, I hope that's right. I, I think it is. Um, anyway, you could have done it that way. It's 14.76, so let's convert this to a fraction. It's 369 25 So we have 
y squared equals 369 25ths, which means y equals plus or minus root 369 over root 25. Root 25 is a value of 5. 25 is a perfect square. And now we can't, we can't hide from previous math skills. We learn certain things in 10 and 11 because we have to continue using them here. We have to try to simplify root 369. Just like if I had root 18, I can write it as root 9 root 2, which is 3 root 2. I'm looking at this number, 369, and asking, is there a perfect square that's divisible? Well, I'm pretty sure 9 is. I'm pretty sure 9 goes into 369. I think it goes in 41 times. So that means that root 369 is root 9 root 41 which means it's 3 root 41 because the square root of 9 is 3. So here are your two y coordinates. Now, let's plot them. Well, we don't really need to plot them. We've already plotted them, right? 3.2 comma positive 3 root 41 over 5. 3.2 negative 3 root 41 over 5. I suppose we should put in our rotation angles. And just for kicks, I would like you to calculate what 3 times the square root of 41 divided by 5 is. What's well, that? 3.84, isn't it? Can you calculate what that decimal approximation of that y-coordinate is? 3.84? Well, look at this. Doesn't that look like 3.84? And doesn't that look like negative 3.84? Pretty close. All right. Any questions with number 3? Yeah, Ian. Yep. I threw that into my calculator and I converted it to a fraction of 369 over 25. Where did you get the 41? I simplified root 369. Go ahead, Arden. That's interesting. I've never, hmm. If what you're saying is what I think you're saying, I've never heard of people doing that before, but it works. You're saying, I'm going to multiply, we're talking about from here. I'm going to change this to 25y squared equals 625 minus 256. That's really good. I like that. I'm going to remember that. that. I've never seen over 33 years of teaching, nobody's ever come up with that. That's a brilliant way to get rid of those fractions and then recombine them into fractions. So you don't, you're not really thinking of a common denominator. I'm, I like that. Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, if you did that on a diploma exam, I think most markers would look at it and go, what's, what's this person doing? And then they would figure it out. All right, let's uh, move on. Now we're going to spend the next 20 minutes or so building the unit circle. So we're going to need this pink sheet called building the unit circle. And there is something that you were taught in math 20-1 that when I teach it to you, I end up saying, uh, this will be on your unit exam, but it's really not that important to your success in trig in 20-1. But the reason we do it is when you get to 30-1, it doesn't hit you out of the blue. You've seen it before. Okay. 
So to begin with, when we refer to a specific location on the unit circle, we call it P of theta. So going back to, say, I'll go back to this point here, where I have P brackets, x comma y, n brackets. That's a standard notation for a point that you have all been used to using, where you have the label of the point P, and then you have the actual x and y coordinates. What I'm telling you is that that doesn't have to be written in that fashion. It can be written as p of theta. And this goes back to what I told you about the unit circle, which is that x and y and theta are all connected. They're connected to each other as well as to the radius, which happens to be 1. So if I give you, for example, I'm going to go to a different one now, one that we did where we had this point here. I would like you to calculate this angle. Now, it's not a tough calculation. All you have to do is recognize that this point is halfway between the two axes. So I want to know either how many degrees or how many radians that is from 0 all the way to there. Would you agree it's 180 plus 45? It's 225. So I could call that point, instead of saying what I have in green, I could say this, 225, 180 plus 45. I could say that. I could say P of 225 degrees is that point, because at 225 degrees, those are the coordinates, negative 1 over root 2, comma negative 1 over root 2. They mean the same thing. They're pointing to the same location. Now, if I wanted to talk about radians, then I would say this is 1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4 pi over 4, 5 pi over 4, which is why if you look at your sheet called building the unit circle, this point is labeled p of 5 pi over 4. And in fact, everybody, we know those coordinates, don't we? By, by a lucky break, there was an example where we calculated those coordinates. So if you want, you could put them in. And you'll notice I'm using root 2 over 2 here as opposed to 1 over root 2. So now, setting the stage here, let me explain what it is our goal is. Our goal is for you to be able to put the ordered pair for every single point that you're looking at on this unit circle, but they have to be exact values. They can't be decimals. That's our goal, for all of these ordered pairs to be labeled. So now let me go back to your lesson. So that's what the notation means. So if I wanted p of 30 degrees, I would need to know the x and y coordinates at this point. But we're going to go slowly. What is p of 0? So think about this for a second. If we take a look on your unit circle, if I say what is p of 0, I want to know the x and y coordinates at that point but the radius of this circle is 1. So the x-coordinate here has to be 1 because the distance from the center of the circle to that point is 1. The y-coordinate, of course, at 0 degrees is 0 because at 0 degrees the point lies on the x-axis. For these other three, I'm just going to show using arm mo motions up here. And if you're watching on video, then you'll miss out on that. But if I take a look at p of pi over 2, and this is how you're going to end up thinking. Pi over 2 is here. 
I'm holding my arm vertically and it's touching the top of the unit circle, but the radius of the circle is one. So that means the y coordinate up there is one. And since it's vertical, directly vertical from the origin, the x coordinate is zero. And this is something that I think is, is becomes very standard. If I say to you, what is the x and y ordered pair up here? And I do this. You go, well, it's 0, 1. Here, 1, 0. What about over here at 180 degrees or at pi? Well, the x coordinate is negative 1 now, and the y coordinate is 0. As you move around the unit circle, the x coordinate goes from 1 to 0 to negative 1 to 0 to 1 to 0 to negative 1, to z et cetera. The y coordinate goes from 0 to 1 to 0 to negative 1 to 0, and it cycles like that. So at pi, we're dealing with negative 1, comma, 0. 3 pi over 2 is 0, comma, negative 1, because you're at the bottom of the unit circle. The x coordinate there is 0. The y coordinate is negative 1. And I'm going under assumption here that you know where pi over 2 is, where 3 pi over 2 is, where pi is. 2 pi, well, we're back at the beginning where this can go on forever. So label these coordinates on the sheet titled Building the Unit Circle. So, uh, you know, you're going to put over here at p of 0, you're going to put... 1 comma 0. Up at the top, you're going to put 0 comma 1. At pi, it's negative 1 comma 0. And really, I, I know students like to look at what I'm writing, but you should be looking up here and going negative 1 comma 0. Oh yeah, that makes sense. You should almost have that in your head before you confirm it up here. If you're just in copying mode and you're not thinking about what you're writing, it, it's not as good. And down at the bottom, 0, comma, negative 1. Any questions with those? We called them in Math 20 quadrantal positions or quadrantal angles. Okay, so now we're going to do P of pi over 6. And I've given you some workspace here. I've given you a little triangle, and I've given you the quadrant 1 that has pi over 6 in it. And I hope it's not lost on you if you look up here that I can take this triangle and I can put it in here, right? That triangle that you have drawn on paper is the triangle over here, which means that this x-coordinate and y-coordinate are given by the lengths of these sides. The x-coordinate is this distance. The y-coordinate is this distance. So what we are trying to do is the following. We are saying, if we have this triangle with a hypotenuse of 1, because it's on the unit circle, what's x and y? How many of you remember doing this last year? Except maybe, maybe, particularly if you were in Mr. Hetlinger's class, he used the hypotenuse of 2. How many of you vaguely remember doing this? Kind of. I use 1 because we're going to use the unit circle. Can somebody tell me why, and I don't know if anybody's going to remember this, why I know that the y value here is 1 half? There's a little trick to see that it's 1 half. I mean, I could just remember that on a 30 degree angle, the opposite side is 1 half of the hypotenuse. The trick is this. If I take this triangle and I flip it vertically, then I get this. If this is, I'm going to talk about degrees now, if this is 30 degrees, which it is, 
then this is 30 degrees. If that's 30 degrees and this is a right angle, this is 60 degrees. That makes this 60 degrees. We're dealing with a large equilateral triangle. This entire thing is equilateral. 60 degrees, 60 degrees, 60 degrees. And if it's equilateral, all the sides are equal. And if all the sides are equal, the length of this side must be equal to 1 because that's the length of the other sides. And since those two triangles are the same, each of those triangles have to form half of that 1. You don't have to construct this every time. However, what we now know is that y equals 1 half, r equals 1. You should be able to come up with the x coordinate by using x squared plus y squared equals 1 because it's on the unit circle. So we have x squared plus 1 half quantity squared equals 1. We square a half and get one quarter. When you square a half, you square the numerator of one, you square the denominator of one of two, so you get one over four. I subtract one quarter from both sides, giving me three quarters. I take the square root plus or minus root 3 over root 4. So I get x equals positive root 3 over 2 or negative root 3 over 2. But I dump this one out because it's in quadrant 1. Look at the diagram. Look at what we're talking about here. We're talking about this picture, which is in quadrant 1. So x equals root 3 over 2. So p of pi over 6 is root 3 over 2, comma, 1 half. And I'm going to tell you that you will remember, hopefully all of you will remember, when one of the two, x or y, is 1 half, the other one will always be root 3 over 2. Always. Okay. So if I told, no, I won't go there. So that's the ordered pair at pi over 6 or at 30 degrees. Let's take a look at the next diagram or the next situation. What is p of pi over 4? Well, you know what? You know this already. How many of you know what the ordered pair is here? Okay. Let's do it, though. If this is a pi over 4 angle in the triangle, which is 45 degrees, Sometimes it is easier to think in terms of degrees. Then since this is 90, the two small angles have to add up to give 90, to give us 180 in total, which means this angle is 45 degrees. We're dealing with an isosceles triangle, which means that this side and this side are the same. So I am going to set up the Pythagorean theorem and I'm going to call each of those two sides S. I don't want to call them both X because one is a Y. So I'm going to say that 1 squared, the hypotenuse, well, it's 1 equals X squared plus Y squared, right? So 1 equals side squared plus side squared, which means 1 equals 2S squared, that means s squared equals 1 half, so s equals plus or minus root 1 over root 2. Which means s equals positive 1 over root 2. or negative 1 over root 2. But since we are in quadrant 1, we throw the negative 1 over root 2 out. Toss it in the bin. 
So we get 1 over root 2. Well, didn't we know that? I had mentioned this by going back to one of our examples. I think it was where we were at 225 degrees. That when you are at a 45 degree reference angle, so you're just as far from the x and y axes, no matter how you measure it, you're just as far, you're in the middle, that the two numbers will always be 1 over root 2, or root 2 over 2. So what we can put up here, uh, let's put root 2 over 2. And we're, we're so close to being done. It's, it's going to seem overwhelming when we put it all together, but we have almost all of the information we need to fill in everything on the unit circle. The final one is, what about at pi over 3? But if you take a look at this triangle in the third column in your notes and compare it to the triangle in the first column, they're the same triangle, aren't they? It's just that in the first column, the short side was y and the long side was x. But here, the short side is x. Well, x is a half. I mean, I could flip this over and go through the equilateral triangle explanation again. But the bottom line, and I can now show you on the back of your unit circle, I don't know if you've noticed, I have those two triangles with the sides labeled. And whenever we have that 30 degree, 60 degree, 90 degree angle, the hypotenuse is 1. The longest side that's not the hypotenuse is always going to be root 3 over 2. And the shortest side will be 1 half. So we know the coordinates here. This is 1 half comma root 3 over 2. Well, there you go. If one of the ordered pair halves is 1 half, the other one is root 3 over 2. Always. So look what you kind of have to remember so far. If it's at a 45 degree position, the x and y have the same values of 1 over root 2 or root 2 over 2. If it's at a 30 or a 60 degree angle, one of the numbers is a half, one of the numbers is root 3 over 2. If it's at an x-intercept or a y-intercept, you should very easily be able to figure out what the ordered pair is by looking at the radius of the circle and where that point is. So what are we asked to do? We are asked to label these points on this sheet. So we have learned that p of pi over 6 is root 3 over 2, 1 half. Now I'm going to show you how you can tell that is the ordered pair without doing any of that work. And I'm going to do it freehand to show you how well it works. You don't need a perfect circle. If I said to you, we've just determined this, look, I'm going to jump up to pi over 3. Pi over 3 is the mirror image, xy speaking, of pi over 6, so these numbers are reversed. Pi over 4 is where the x and y are the same. I think I've got root 2 over 2's going on here. And if you can get quadrant 1, you're done. Because think about this. These two points here have the same y coordinate. They have the same reference angle. And if they have the same y coordinate, they better have the same x coordinate, except that the one at 2 pi over 3 will have a negative x coordinate. So we're kind of doing a reflection thing here. This would be negative 1 half, negative root 3 over 2. Now, you don't have to do that. You could say this. You could say, well, I know one of these numbers is a half, positive or negative. Does that look like a half? Or does that look like a half? Well, the x-coordinate looks like a half. Because don't forget the radius of the circle is 1. Uh, 
you know, if this point here is root 2 over 2, comma, root 2 over 2, then this point over here must have the same values except the x-coordinate is negative. If p at pi over 6 is root 3 over 2, comma, a half, then at 5 pi over 6, I just want to make sure you guys understand that quadrant 1 and 2 are symmetrical with each other across the y-axis, right, in terms of these points. So all I'm doing is I'm kind of reflecting p of pi over 6 to the other side where the x-coordinate becomes negative. It's really a reflection, except it's not of a function. It's of a relation that's a circle. I could, you know, I could reflect quadrant 1 down, and then I could reflect quadrant 4 to the left, or I could reflect quadrant 2 down to quadrant 3. If 5 pi over 6 has a y coordinate of a half, then 7 pi over 6 will have a y coordinate of negative a half because it's below the x axis, and the x coordinate will be negative. And again, you don't have to do this through reflections. For example, we could just say right here what kind of numbers are we dealing with there? Well, that's a point midway between the axes, so that's a 45 degree reference angle which means x and y are the same. They're both root 2 over 2, except y is negative. Take a minute, please, and complete your unit circle, and then I'm going to explain the significance of what it is we're doing here. Why are we doing this? And by the way, in question three, it says use the information from two and three above to label the coordinates. This is what we're doing, but we're using the information from number two. There is no three above. So, so what? What's the big deal about the unit circle? There's more to it than this, but I would like everybody to pick one of those points on the unit circle. There's many more points on the unit circle, but those are the ones that we now have direct information of. Question? Question? No, just checking. Uh, pick a point. Any point. Look at the angle of that point. And I want you, that angle is in radians, so I want you to put your calculator in radians. And then I want you to take the cosine of that angle. So Nick, which angle did you choose or which point did you choose? Pi over 6? Okay. So if we take pi over 6, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you picked that one. i got to be in radians. I am. I'm saying take the cosine of pi over 6. That's what I'm asking you to do. If you picked a different angle, you're going to get maybe a different number. What do I get? I get 0.866. Wait a minute. Isn't that root 3 over 2? And that's the x-coordinate at pi over 6, isn't it? Let's try a different one. Arden, did you choose a different angle? I chose um, 7 over 6 pi. 7 pi over 6? Okay. Or 7, I see what you mean, 7 over 6 multiplied by pi. So let's take the cosine of 7 pi divided by 6. I'm glad you chose that one. You get negative 0.866, which is negative root 3 over 2. That's the x-coordinate at that point. What if you chose, uh, I'm going to choose 7 pi over 4. So look where 7 pi over 4 is on your unit circle. And if you need help finding it, you should be able to see it in your head this way, because you're not given this for an exam. Look up here for a minute. 
1 pi over 4, 2 pi over 4, 3 pi over 4, 4, 5, 6, 7 pi over 4. If I take the cosine of 7 pi over 4, what do I get? I get, let me do that again. I forgot my divided by. I get positive 0 0.707. Well, guess what? That's root 2 over 2. That's the x coordinate of that point. So what we discover is that on the unit circle, the x coordinate, this is only on the unit circle, equals the cosine of the rotation angle. Always. You could try it for some of those other angles like the 0 or pi or 3 pi over 2 or pi over 2. By the way, you don't have to be in radians. You can do this in degrees. Just make sure when you take the cosine, you don't put 7 pi over 4. You put 315 degrees. You just have to enter the angle in degrees. You still get the same cosine. Uh, I think you can suspect that what's going to happen here for number 5. I'll leave it up to you to confirm this. But it turns out the y coordinate on the unit circle will always be equal to sine of theta. Always. We'll talk about tangent later. Before I let you loose on some practice, I want to give you an example of what we've discovered here. What we've discovered, everybody, is that on the unit circle, p of theta is cos theta comma sine theta. That's what we've discovered. So a classic exam question would tell you we have a rotation angle of 484 degrees and the terminal arm intersects the unit circle at some point. I'll use A and B. A comma B. What is the value of A and what is the value of B? And to some people, you can stare at this all day and not know how you're going to solve this. The bottom line is A has to be the cosine of 484 degrees, and B has to be the sine of 484 degrees. And that's how you would solve it. A equals cos 484. B equals sine 484. It's that simple. I mean, it's a memory thing. You have to remember that the, the angle doesn't have to be one of these special angles that we've put on there. I think we've got 16 of them. It doesn't have to be any one of those 16. It could be any angle. It's still x comma y is cos theta comma sine theta. And the more intimate you become with the unit circle, the more familiar you become with it, the better off you're going to be, not just in this, this unit, but even more so in the next unit. Anyway, the coordinates of any point are si cos theta comma sine theta on the unit circle. The relationship between x and y on the unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals 1. And if it's not a unit circle, but it's centered at the origin, it's x squared plus y squared equals r. And just so you know, if you were to take your beautiful unit circle that you've constructed now, if you were to make it into a circle of radius 5, all of these numbers would be multiplied by 5. That's all. But we want to stick with the unit circle. On page 186, questions 1 to 6, I'm saying, you know, do every second letter. If you want to do uh, the, quote, odd letters, A, C, E, that's fine. If you want to do the even letters, B, D, F, that's fine. But you certainly don't need to do them all.